Hi, everyone. Judge Andrew Napolitano here for Judging Freedom. Today is Wednesday, April 17th, 2024. Aaron Matei joins us now. My friend, Aaron, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Um, the Wall Street Journal reports this morning uh, a bitter and what they call irreconcilable uh, differences in the Israeli war cabinet between Prime Minister Netanyahu and uh, his uh, publicly known adversary, Benny Gantz, and the um, uh, defense minister, uh, Gallant. Can you um, enlighten us at all on this and let us know if, in your view, it is deleterious uh, to Israel or normal for Israeli politics? It is normal because these are all people who want power. And Netanyahu's rivals, who also serve in his government, recognize that he uh, is in trouble. Uh, he faced corruption allegations before October 7th. He faced massive protests in the streets over his attempts to control uh, the Israeli judiciary. And so they're seeing now, uh, more than six months into this genocide, Israel's allies in the U.S. are voicing increasing discomfort. You have articles in Haaretz and the Wall Street Journal pointing out that Israel strategically is not winning this war. They failed to do much damage to Hamas far less than many people, myself included, expected. And so they're taking advantage. And they're trying to, I think, maneuver to push out Netanyahu at a time when he's vulnerable. What did you expect of the uh, Israeli military? I expected more damage too, but I, I don't have the uh, the granular knowledge of, uh, of this that you do. Well, the one thing I was sure of, and I tweeted this on the day of October 7th, that Israel would continue its war on Palestinian civilians and punish them for what happened on October 7th, because that's what Israel's done throughout its history. Uh, you go back many years, 1967, the year when uh, Israel took over so many uh, Arab territories, the West Bank, Gaza, Golan Heights, the Sinai. Um, back then, Ariel Sharon was saying that, you know, we, we have to establish our main weapon, which is their fear of us. Itak Rabin, the so, supposed father of the Israeli peace process, said when he was defense minister during the first Intifada that Israeli soldiers cracking down on nonviolent fighters, breaking their bones, as he advised, that we were using our main weapon, which is instilling fear. So that's been a through line throughout Israeli history. And there was no doubt that once the unruly natives showed that they could resist and embarrass Israel on October 7th, the Palestinian civilians would pay the price. And I didn't foresee Israel being able to destroy so much of Gaza as they as they have done because I'd have imagined that the world would have stepped in. But unfortunately, Israel's most reliable ally, the U.S., has facilitated this from the start. And when it comes to Hamas's military resistance, I knew that there would be some resistance, but I did not expect that more than six months in, Hamas would still be intact. And that's a tribute to the resistance that they've put up, which continues just as we're speaking. Israel saying that more of its soldiers have been wounded inside Gaza. Uh, do any of the three of them, Netanyahu, uh, Gantz, or uh, Gallant, truly want a ceasefire? Or are the negotiations in Cairo just a facade intended to please the United States? I think it's pretty clear there's that it's a facade for these people. They know that uh, if they do not completely destroy Hamas, then this will be seen inside Israel as a, a, as a strategic defeat. And they also want to buy time to not only you know kill more Palestinian civilians, but make Gaza unlivable, which is another main goal of this war. That's why they've been targeting hospitals, schools, flattening all of Gaza's universities, hitting mosques, hitting churches, anything they can to make the civilians of Gaza not want to live there anymore after this genocide ends. Do you think that the uh, United States, uh, through intelligence, I guess CIA, uh, was involved in the Israeli uh, attack on the Iranian uh, consulate in Damascus? Well, but the Biden administration claims that they had no prior knowledge, and I just find that very hard to believe. There was an article in the Wall Street Journal uh, a few years ago pointing out that pretty much every single Israeli strike inside Syria that is targeted at Iran and its allies that operate in Syria is done with joint coordination uh, so the idea that for the first time that Israel acted alone in going after Iran's consulate inside Syria after so many strikes, hundreds of them were carried out jointly between 
the U.S. and Israel, which is why I always refer to these strikes as U.S.-Israeli strikes inside Syria, not just Israeli, because the U.S. is so closely involved. I find it hard to believe. You, you never know. I mean, the problem here is Israel is so reckless and Netanyahu is so contemptuous of Biden, despite Biden's efforts to, you know, bend over backwards to give Israel anything it wants, that, uh, you know, it's plausible to me that Israel could have acted alone here. But given the history of joint U.S. coordination, I would bet personally that the U.S. did have prior knowledge and maybe even have been involved. Is there any moral justification for the Israeli attack? Or is it merely uh, Netanyahu wanting to pick a fight with Iran in the hopes that the U.S. will join him and the war will go on and on and on and his premiership will go on and on and on? I think the goal is exactly that. Provoke Iran into retaliating to the point where the U.S. feels compelled to get involved on Israel's side more than it already is. And that's because Netanyahu understands that if he wants to fight Hezbollah, he wants to fight Iran, he needs the U.S.'s help because Iran and Hezbollah, unlike the people of Gaza, can actually really fight back and do damage to Israel. So I think that was the goal of that strike, to provoke Iran so that the U.S. gets involved on Israel's side. The moral justification that Israel and the U.S. put out is interesting. They're arguing that because this consulate in Iran, they say, was being used for military purposes, uh, as evidenced by the fact that you had a senior Iranian general there, then that makes it a valid military target. Well, by that definition, then pretty much every U.S. embassy around the world would be a target because how many U.S. embassies act as cover for CIA agents to plot whatever they're plotting inside a given country? How many CIA agents, for example, were inside Ukraine when the U.S. backed a coup there, uh, uh, working inside the U.S. embassy under diplomatic cover? This is standard procedure for many countries, not just the U.S., so if the U.S. and Israel really want to go there and say that because there is an intelligence operative or a military operative working undercover inside a consulate, that makes it fair game, that's going to open up a very dangerous precedent in which the U.S. could be extremely damaged. And nobody wants that. That's why we have something called international law, which Israel, with U.S. support, with either directly or tacitly, just flagrantly violated by bombing that consulate in Damascus. Um, many of the uh, folks that come on this show who have a military background have argued that the uh, Iranian military response uh, was brilliant and moral. Brilliant because it forced the Israelis to waste a billion dollars shooting down virtually harmless uh, drones. Moral because the only um, missiles that got through uh, attack genuine military and intelligence targets, moral because the Iranians told uh, the Saudis, who must have informed the Israelis, exactly what was coming and when uh, it was coming. Do you accept that? Yeah, I think it's a very fair argument. Uh, as you point out, nobody was killed in Iran's response. Compare that to Israel, which killed seven people at that Iranian consulate. Uh, unlike Israel, Iran gave plenty of advance warning already, uh, you know, days before the Iranian strikes, the Financial Times was reporting that Iran had sent signals via intermediaries to the U.S. that its response was going to be calibrated so as not to encourage an escalation by Israel. So Iran uh, deliberately chose its targets to be military sites, deliberately gave Israel and the U.S. plenty of advance notice, not only days before, but even on the night of. As the drones and missiles were launched, it was announced. Everyone knew they were coming, which gave Israel and the U.S. plenty of time to prepare to shoot them down. Uh, the only missiles that could not be shot down were those that hit military bases inside Israel, uh, which hit their targets and showed Israel that if this continues, Iran has the capability to pierce their missile systems. But again, those strikes didn't kill anybody because right. Iran gave plenty of advance notice. And those strikes happened to target bases that were used in the operation to carry out the bombing of Syria, which triggered this whole round of escalation to begin with. And because the uh, drones had some sort of uh, computer equipment on them, they know exactly where the Israeli defenses are because they know where the missiles were coming from to uh, attack the drones. It's almost as if the, uh, the drones uh, were pawns in a chess game that you intentionally uh, use to lure your enemy out. Absolutely. You know, I heard a funny argument from Marco Rubio, Senator Marco Rubio, who said that because there was lights on these drones, that those lights, just the sight of, of these lit up drones, that that was enough to terrorize the Israeli people. And he was so indignant that these drones that Iran la launched had lights on them. 
Well, if you have lights on them, it also means you can see them, which makes it easier to shoot them down. Right. Marco Rubio, so determined to defend Israeli aggression and paint it as a victim, was trying to argue that by having lights on these drones, that Iran, even though these drones could easily be shot down, was terrorizing the Israeli people. He's running for uh, a slot on the uh, ticket with Trump, I think, and not doing uh, not doing a very good job. I want to play a clip. This is really absurd, but it gets more absurd. This is uh, David Cameron, Lord David Cameron, the British uh, uh, foreign minister, uh, harshly critical of the massive degree of difference between the uh, Israeli attack in Damascus and the uh, Iranian attack. He, he's not concerned about human life. He's not concerned about the, the sanctity of um, a, a consulate, a diplomatic consulate. He's only concerned about, well, you'll hear him, the number of drones in the air. So, cut number four. What about Iran's frustration at part of its sovereign territory being flattened? Well, I would argue there is a, a massive degree of difference between what Israel did in Damascus and, as I said, 301 weapons being launched by the state of Iran at the state of Israel. For the first time, a state-on-state -state attack. 101 ballistic missiles, 36 cruise missiles, 185 drones. That is a degree of difference. Yeah. And I think a reckless and dangerous thing for Iran to have done. And I think the whole world can see all these countries that have somehow wondered, well, you know, what is the true nature of Iran? It's there okay. in black and white. Does he know what he's talking about? He knows full well uh, that Israel triggered this round of escalation by bombing Iran's consulate first, and unlike Iran, actually killing people. He also knows that these drones, by virtue of them being launched from Iranian territory, maybe some were also sent from Iraq, that Israel had plenty of time to knock them down, and that Iran was just trying to show something because it had to respond to Israel bombing its consulate and killing seven people. He knows all this, but he needs, to, he needs to come up with an excuse to somehow pretend as if Iran is at fault here. He says there a line about this being unprecedented for the first time, state-on-state -state violence. First of all, Israel's attack on the Iranian consulate itself, that was state-on-state -state violence because the consulate is considered sovereign Iranian territory. But well before that, Israel has carried out assassinations of Iranian scientists. It's invaded Lebanon multiple times, killing tens of thousands of people. So this idea that what Iran did and responding to Israel's attack on Iran is somehow unprecedented. It's just a farce. But th this is the depth that Cameron has to go to to justify the aggression that he supports. All right, well, watch him now uh, with her follow-up question, and you'll see him mumbling and uh, fumbling as he attempts to answer it. Number 10. What would Britain do if a hostile nation flattened one of our consulates? Well, we would take, uh, uh, we, you know, we would take the very strong action. And Iran would say that that's what they did? Well, what they did, as I said, was a so massive they, attack. So they, they were, were right think, to respond, but they overreacted, is well, that what you're I, saying? I, what I'm saying they is that the, right atta the, attack, the attack they carried out was on a very large scale, much bigger than but people they accepted. they have a right to respond? Well, countries have a right to respond. I don't think he liked those questions. He didn't because they're premised on the uh, assumption, which he doesn't accept, that all states have equal rights. But he doesn't see Iran as having equal rights to the UK, the US, and Israel. In, in his conception of the world, we have the right to carry out mass murder, to bomb consulates, to carry out airstrikes on Syria, as the UK has done over the years, and also take part in a dirty war that flooded the country with weapons going to sectarian insurgents in a bid to overthrow the government. We have the right to do all that. They don't have the right to respond. That is his conception of how the world works. And it's exposed when you try to just apply the basic standard of, do we apply the same principles to ourselves that we apply to others? And David Cameron's answer is a resounding no. Uh, yeah. And you can see it right there on display. Here's um, another member of the British government and the legislative branch, a person you and I admire. I won't even tell you who it is, but you'll know in a heartbeat who it is. Cut number five. Uh, speaker, I knew your father well for a very long time. He was a fine man, and I am sincerely sorry for your loss. There was not one single word in the Prime Minister's statement of condemnation of the Israeli destruction of the Iranian consulate in Damascus, which is the proximate reason for 
the event everyone is here in concert condemning. He was not even asked to do so by the front bench opposite. Kay Burley is the only person so far to demand that of a government minister. We have no treaty with Israel, at least not one that Parliament has been shown. And the Iranians are not likely to listen to him when Britain occupied Iran, looted its wealth, and overthrew its one democratic socialist government in my own lifetime. Well, Mr. Mr. Speaker, what, whatever may have happened uh, a few weeks ago, it is absolutely no justification for launching more than 300 drones and missiles from one sovereign state towards Israel. It's as simple as that. And in the Honourable Gentleman's question, not once did he condemn that action or, indeed, the actions of Hamas in the region. There is no equivalence between these things whatsoever, and to suggest otherwise is simply wrong. Yeah. Hear the great George Galloway howling in the background, but they cut his... Uh his microphone off and you can also see that uh, Rishi Sunak and his prime minister got and his uh, prime minister got their talking points down together with the same numbers absolutely they love to make a big spectacle of the amount of drones that Iran launched but again what they omit is that this was launched with plenty of warning to give Israel the time to respond unlike what Israel did uh, in bombing the consulate which is no warning and killing seven people unlike Iran which didn't kill anybody but that's the hypocrisy on display and you can see why right after george galloway recently won his election to be put in parliament immediately the prime minister sunak gave a speech talking about what an alarming thing this was that george galloway could win a, an election and you can see why because he doesn't want to face someone who actually has moral consistency asking him questions which as we can see sunak cannot answer credibly right and as george galloway pointed out without getting too into the weeds of the british parliamentary system none of the shadow cabinet, none of the Labour Party, none of the Liberal Party challenged Prime Minister Sunak. It only took George, who's as far back in the back bench as, he, <laughs> as you can go. I'm surprised they even have microphones back there. It took him to raise this issue. Yeah. Yeah. And imagine, you know, every time I hear George Galloway speak, I just think, imagine if we had someone of that equivalent uh, moral fiber inside our own government, inside our own Congress, inside the U.S. Even those people inside the U.S. Congress who are critics of the prevailing genocide policy, they still always have to qualify their statements. They have to you know, go out of their way to cater to Israeli talking points, to U.S. talking points. George Gallo is a rare person of actual moral consistency, and that's why he's hated so much by the establishment. What is the value of the uh, U.N. Security Council uh, these days with the United States, Great Britain, and France vetoing every le legitimate, lucid effort that they come up with? Well, you know, a, a good illustration is what just happened with Iran, because Iran said, and we'll never know if it's true because of how things have unfolded, but they said that had the UN Security Council acted and actually condemned Israel, which would be the obvious thing to do for a country bombing a diplomatic consulate, that Iran might not have had to respond militarily. It's a counterfactual now, but it's worth considering that Iran said that, that, you know, had the U.S., the UK and France not blocked action at the UN Security Council condem to condemn Israel for what it did in bombing Syria, then maybe Iran's military response would not have been necessary. That's what Iran said, at least. And um, that's what happens when you have this commitment to aggression where not even the bombing of a diplomatic consulate uh, can uh, trigger the US and its allies to condemn Israel because that's they're so committed to protecting Israel and everything it does. And by the way, it's highly symbolic that it would be the U.S., Britain, and France protecting Israeli aggression against Syria because these are the countries that have repeatedly bombed Syria together over allegations of chemical weapons attacks right. by the Syrian government. And you know, as I've reported extensively at the Gray Zone, based on leaked documents from the OPCW, the world's top chemical weapons watchdog, when the OPCW got on the ground in one case, in the case of Duma, April 2018, one of these chemical weapons allegations, they found no evidence of a chemical attack Plenty of evidence that this incident was staged by insurgents on the ground. But that investigation was covered up by the OPCW under pressure of the U.S. And along with France and Britain, uh, which bombed Syria, all these allegations, they've done everything they can to bury 
this scandal at the OPCW. So it's very fitting that now with Israel once again bombing Damascus, uh, that they'd be working very hard to protect Israel at all costs. So you're not surprised that France uh, joined with Great Britain uh, and the U.S. to squelch a very rational, utterly moral, and totally lawful condemnation of the Israeli attack in Damascus. Not at all. These are lackeys of the U.S. And I, I've witnessed this personally. I've testified in front of members of the U.N. Security Council uh, several times now about my reporting on the OPCW cover-up scandal. And the disingenuousness of all these diplomats from especially the U.S., Britain, and France, it, it's so vivid. Um, for example, uh, I, in my most recent presentation about a year ago, after I spoke, the British dip, uh, representative said, I cannot be trusted. Don't listen to uh, Mr. Maté, whatever he says. And when I, before I had the chance to respond, he got up and left the room. Mm. <laughs> It wasn't so, David Cameron, was it? <laughs> it was not David Cameron, no. It was another gentleman. But uh, that's how these people operate. Does Joe Biden, and I'm not asking you to get into his head, Aaron, as smart as you are, I don't think anybody could do that, have any red lines beyond which the Israelis can't go before no, he actually does something? I no, know he's caught made... between genocide on one side of him and the need to win Michigan on the other side of them. Yeah. But does he have any red lines, moral, legal, political, military? If we go by his own words, no, because uh, he recently said that for him, a red line would be an Israeli invasion of Rafa, but then immediately said that uh, he would never cut off weapons to Israel. And now we get reports in the media and actually the administration openly talking about the fact that they're coordinating with Israel in its plans to assault Rafa. So Biden's already violated his own so-called red line, and he's in keeping with what, jo with what John Kirby, his spokesperson, said very early on in the Israeli mass murder campaign in Gaza. He said he was asked if there are any red lines when it comes to Israel's conduct. John Kirby said no. What will happen in the West and in the U.S. if Netanyahu invades Rafah and slaughters another 30,000 uh, civilians or more? Well, you know, what's funny is... Uh, in that interview where Biden initially said he had no red lines, but then walked it back, he also said that uh, Israel cannot kill an another 30,000 Palestinians. So if yeah. his number is 30,000, does that mean he'd be okay with 29,999? Yeah. I, I think he would be based on his behavior so far. So if Israel goes in and commits more mass murder in Rafah, I expect we'll see more of the same. Uh, rearming Israel, pretending to be upset about what, what Israel is doing with selective leaks to media stenographers, all while continuing the policy of supporting Israel and allowing the carnage to continue. Can Netanyahu be trusted with nuclear weapons? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, this is someone who talked about 9-11 being good for Israel, who <clears throat> bragged about being able to manipulate U.S. politicians, uh, who spent his career trying to uh, wipe out Palestinian self-determination. I do not trust Netanyahu or anybody in that government with nuclear weapons. And they've gotten increasingly bellicose over the years, which is saying something because this is a government that's been bellicose. Uh, There's a country that's been bellicose for its entire existence. It was founded on ethnic cleansing. In 1967, it expanded by taking over even more territory from stealing land from Syria, from Egypt, uh, the West Bank and Gaza as well. And now it's laying claim to annexing parts of the West Bank, uh, talking about wiping out the people of Gaza. So under no circumstance should this government have anything to do with nuclear weapons, but yet our policy is to pretend as if it's not a problem and support Israel in its nuclear program. Aaron, thank you very much, my dear friend. Again, your your knowledge of all this is encyclopedic, uh, and uh, I'm deeply grateful for your sharing it with us. All the best. Thank you, Judge. Of course. Uh, deeply grateful for that uh, that interview with that bright young man. Coming up tomorrow at 8.45 in the morning, Senator Rand Paul on his latest battles with uh, Dr. Fauci uh, over COVID on FISA, actually allowing more spying now, although the Senate hasn't ratified what the House uh, has sent over, and on what a waste $61 billion will be in Ukraine. That's at 8.45 tomorrow morning at 3 in the afternoon, Professor John Mearsheimer, and at four in the afternoon, the one, the only, the inimitable Max Blumenthal, Judge Napolitano for Judging Freedom.